inside story, dark secrets, strange rituals, inciting hatred and fear. This, for God's sake, was a bloody murder. Two shocking murders. A teenager executed by his own brother. The wife and I walked around for a week, ten days. Didn't know where we were or what we were doing. A young mother fatally trapped in a web of black magic and sex. She was scared. The next thing I know, I'm on top of Melissa. My hands are around the throat. And in the shadows, the manipulators pulling the strings. The school teacher was a member of the notorious Ku Klux Klan. It's a little bit scary that something like that can be on your back doorstep. Hey, piss off. Absolute shock. Hello, I'm Leila McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. You have to ask, how could it happen here? A respected school teacher by day, high priest of the Ku Klux Klan by night. His malign influence would cause havoc and utterly destroy an Australian family. Then, the self-styled guru, who ruled in his own little world of demons, supernatural sex and ultimately murder. Two twisted men with very dangerous ideas, as Deborah Knight discovered firsthand. Layla, it's very twisted indeed, and the consequences of what these men do, it's just so tragic. Two innocent lives lost, a single mum and a teenage boy. It's shocking what these evil men get up to, a real eye-opener. It sure is. As we'll see, while things appeared seemingly normal, what was going on behind closed doors was anything but normal. It's late afternoon on a crisp winter's day in Queensland's Darling Downs. Robert Rollingson is tinkering on his car, oblivious to his impending doom. It's over instantly. A shot to the back of the head from a high-powered rifle. Robert's dead before he hits the ground, but his killer is taking no chances. And the poor lad was lying on the ground and he shot him again in the head. That's, that's Martin Bryan stuff. It was an execution, not a, not a shooting, it was an execution. Late last night, police made the grisly discovery a 19-year-old Pittsworth man's body dumped in a culvert near Clifton. What rocked the Rollingsons' family to its core was the identity of the killer. It was Robert's 16-year-old brother, Anthony. You just couldn't believe that he did it. And your heart must have been breaking. I think the wife and I walked around for a week, 10 days, dumbfounded. Didn't know where we were or what we were doing. It was the ultimate betrayal. But as we'll discover tonight, the mind of the young, impressionable Anthony Rollingson had been poisoned by the violent, hate-filled preachings of the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK is a despicable, quasi-terrorist group of idiots who've got a history of, of violence. And certainly with a young, inexperienced mind, to be filled, have it filled uh, with violence and that sort of rubbish. Obviously, it's got to influence anybody. We're actually just wanting to give him an opportunity to... But when we go searching for answers to what finally made him snap, not everybody is happy uh, to talk. Hey, piss off. In the suburbs of Sydney, an equally bizarre murder. Do it, do it. Melissa Mayfield died at the hands of a controlling sexual predator after being drawn into the dark world of the supernatural. What he done to my daughter? He didn't just kill her. He killed me. And he killed the spirits of her two children. Melissa Mayfield did dabble in the spiritual world, but it was harmless enough. When she met Angela Wells, though, and her partner, David Shepherd, she crossed the line into a dark and dangerous world of demons and supernatural sex. Before she knew it, Melissa was in way too deep. Melissa said it, was, it just happened so quickly. 
she was in shock and she said she didn't willingly partake in it. She didn't? No. She felt dirty. She felt demoralised. Everything she stands for, she felt she had lost. Melissa's life was soon dominated by Shepherd and Wells. The couple claimed they could channel spirits and it was one of these spirits that finally drove them to kill. July 2007, and the rural community of Pittsworth is in mourning. Small town like this, I mean, yeah, it was a bit of a shock. 19-year-old Robert Rollingson has been shot dead by his younger brother, Anthony, just 16. Absolute shock. And everybody said, why could this happen in a town like Pittsworth? Robert Rollingson was one of these lovely, bigger, softer, wonderful young men, a big teddy bear type of a boy, and everybody liked him. As if this crime wasn't shocking enough, it soon emerged that Anthony Rollingson had an accomplice. Incredibly, it was his high school teacher, Graham McNeil, who later confessed to police to being the local head of the Ku Klux Klan. My power! In Princeworth, you probably don't think that that sort of thing exists. It's a little bit scary, really, that something like that can be on your back doorstep. Oh, like, words can't describe what you feel when, you, when we heard that that's what had happened. Graham McNeil may not have pulled the trigger, but his malign influence on the impressionable young Anthony Rollingson was the catalyst for his brother's murder. So you're adamant that Anthony's been put up to this? Well, all the evidence, when you line up the ducks, it all points that way. So he was more, much more than just a, a teacher? Oh, yes. As we'll see tonight, there were disturbing glimpses of Anthony's troubled state of mind long before the murder. The f*** are you doing? Even plans for a Columbine-style massacre. He had prepared a list, as I understand it, of Robert's friends uh, that he apparently intended to kill and uh, obviously he didn't get the chance to do it, thank God. But sadly, Anthony's parents didn't know just how troubled their youngest son was until it was too late. And as the police investigation gets underway, they make the shocking discovery that will break their hearts. I personally couldn't believe that Anthony would do it. Um, his mother... Um, sort of realised that he was the culprit. So she knew? She knew. Coming up on Inside Story, how the high priest, his school teacher, twisted a young boy's mind. Remember, he was 16. 16. John Rawlingson is a third generation farmer. His family has been working the rich soils in these parts for close to 70 years. We're um, largely grain growing. And the, the farm has been your life, really? You've been on the farm? Yeah. <laughs> since a boy? And... Yep. It was always John's dream. His two boys, Robert and Anthony, would take over when he retired, until that fateful winter's afternoon in 2007. This lush, rolling farmland in the heart of Queensland's Darling Downs was the backdrop to what seemed to be a happy childhood for Robert Rowlandson and his younger brother, Anthony. But from his early teens, a toxic mix of hatred and resentment was simmering away in Anthony's mind. I think he was jealous of the, of the fact that his older brother was popular, was successful, had friends and all that. I think there was a big resentment thing in him. But I think that he uh, was twisted by McNeil. Certainly Robert, an apprentice motor mechanic, and his young brother, Anthony, a gifted student, couldn't be more different. Robert was always an outdoor boy. Anthony was always an indoor boy. We used to often call him nocturnal because you only see him at night. He'd be in his room all day, whatever he was doing with the games. And How would you say their relationship was? There was um, some friction between the 
two boys, but, but mm. I mean, there was nothing major as far as we were concerned. It's the, it's the far. School friend John Stevens remembers Robert Rollingson as a gregarious knockabout bloke who loved his footy, fast cars, and girls. Mate, Robert was just a great mate. He was always there to talk to um, and pick you up. He was just a ball of laughter. He was a little bit crazy at times, but that's, mate, that's what Robert was and that's why everyone loved him. What sort of person was Anthony? Just seemed to me a little bit withheld and was never friendly and warm, never, never warm, I suppose you would say. As he grew older, Anthony became increasingly withdrawn, his behaviour more and more bizarre. Other students here at Pittsworth High School say he became obsessed with violent video games and guns and even fantasised about killing someone. It was just a matter of time before he did. There was word out that there was a hit list and a large group of good mates and friends and associates, I suppose you'd say, were, were on this list and, and uh, that in itself is a little bit bone chilling. And you were on that list too, weren't you? Uh, word has it, yeah. Yeah. While Anthony was shunned by fellow students, he became close to one of his teachers, Graham McNeil. McNeil was also a counsellor at Pittsworth High, but this seemingly respectable man had a dark secret. He was a high priest of the Ku Klux Klan. No, I think he was, uh, he had really evil intent. You, you can put a lot of that down to, oh, he's just a weirdo or something like that, but, but the bloke was a school teacher. And in Anthony Rollingson, the manipulative Graham McNeil found a willing student for his twisted teachings. This kid, I think, was possibly like a sponge, and he just soaked it all up. And when you've got somebody with ideas that are very different and way out, and you're a child with an inquiring mind, you soak it all up readily. Remember, he was 16. 16. It appears what finally drove Anthony to murder his brother was a seemingly minor incident here at the family farm. Robert had discovered secret evidence of Graham McNeil's involvement with the Ku Klux Klan. When Robert threatened to go to the police, Anthony decided his brother had to die. The terrible climax to this family tragedy came on the afternoon of July 15, 2007, while the boy's parents were visiting friends after going to church. Anthony took his father's .243 calibre rifle from the gun safe and crept up on his brother, who was working in the back shed. So he came up from behind him, no warning at all? That's right. And shot him once in the back of the head. He then walked over, stood over Robert and shot him a second time. At close range? At close range. Two shots to the back of the head? Yes. Well, I mean, it's just awful. It's appalling. I mean, that's a really twisted mind. That's, that's Martin and Brian stuff. Anthony then used a forklift to load Robert's lifeless body into the boot of his brother's car. Graham. He phoned Graham McNeil, told him what he'd done, and drove into town where they met outside the local bakery. Problems in the boot. They were the words he used. They were the words he used. The problem being his dead brother, it's a very cold and calculating way of describing very, the situation. It's very removed, yes. The pair then drove 40 kilometres out of town to an isolated bridge. Oh. So they've, they've chucked it over the edge, and then what? Anthony's come down to where we are here and has dragged the, uh, Robert's body underneath the bridge. So he's dragged him underneath, out of sight? Yes. And then they've gone back into town? Returned to the vehicle and driven off back into town. Mm. Coming up, the startling confession. I shot him from behind twice. And his head exploded like a watermelon when I pulled the trigger. And a confrontation with the clan. Piss off. Robert Rollingson has been shot dead by his younger brother, Anthony, his body dumped under a bridge with the help of his teacher, Graham McNeil. 
When Robert didn't return home that Sunday night, his parents weren't unduly concerned. And it would be two days before they learned the shocking truth. So did you have a gut feeling that something was wrong? Not specifically. When his, one of his mates rang up and said that they found the car in a back street of Pittsworth, we wondered what was going on. Meanwhile, Anthony Rollingson continued to act as if nothing had happened. The day after the murder, going to school as normal. So he didn't show any unusual no. behaviour? Not from his behaviour, but when you start looking at things, you picked up this, this wasn't right and that wasn't right, and you started putting it all together and uh, it just all led one way. Alarm bells rang for John Rollinson when he discovered a large pool of blood and spent rifle casings near this machinery shed. There was also blood on a fork tractor parked nearby. When he quizzed his younger son about it, Anthony told him he'd shot a cat. Instantly, John knew his son was lying. He knew Anthony had done something terrible. We knew something had gone on. Um, his mother... Um, sort of realised that he was the culprit, um, so... So she knew? She knew. Do you know anything about the disappearance of your brother? No comment. No comment. When police first interviewed Anthony, he lied. He was evasive. He treated it all as a bit of a joke. I had informed him that I'd shot a cat. Is the scroll it, Mum? Very, with a tail. A cat. But he finally confessed to the murder. I then proceeded to come up from behind him with the 243 rifle and uh, shot him from behind twice. He said um, his head exploded like a watermelon when I pulled the trigger. And he just came out with that? Out of the, yes. Completely Unprovoked. out of the blue? Yep. So what was the response to police when he, when he said that? Uh, just complete shock. The, um, particularly in the manner in which it was delivered was quite unexpected. And what sort of manner was that? Very, again, very calm, very measured, in control. And no emotion? No emotion. Or remorse? Not at all. Two days after Robert Rollingson disappeared, police gave his parents the news they'd been dreading. His body had been found dumped here in this culvert at the remote Ryford waterway, about 40 minutes drive from the family farm. He'd been shot twice in the back of the head at point blank range. It was an execution, not a... Not a shooting, it was an execution because you don't put two bullets in like that. And your heart must have been breaking. I think the wife and I walked around for a week, ten days, dumbfounded. Didn't know where we were or what we were doing. Mm. I think you go into like a, a disbelief. It, it, could, it didn't happen, it couldn't have happened. It's, you know, the old, the old blue falcon's going to come roaring around the corner sideways any minute and Robbo's going to be driving it, you know what I mean? It's not, you sort of, I think you try and, you don't let it in, if you know what I mean. You try and pretend that it hasn't happened and everything's going to be all right. Despite his, at times, graphic confession, Anthony Rollingson refused to implicate his accomplice, Graeme McNeil. So did he ring you before you got home? Yes. And what was that conversation then? So you had a conversation on Sunday mm. and you can't recall what it was about? No. He never made admissions to being with Mr McNeil at all. In fact, he said that he had transported the body himself, he had removed the body from the car himself and placed it under the bridge himself. He never placed Mr McNeil anywhere at the scene. McNeil eventually came under suspicion after police discovered Anthony had phoned him on the afternoon of the murder. When police arrived at Graeme McNeil's house, they were shocked to find white robes, hoods and race hate material. The school teacher was a member of the notorious white supremacist group, the Ku Klux Klan. So this is the, the Klansman costume. It's uh, full regalia. With his, uh, yeah, with his particular signals of office. Were you surprised? Absolutely. It was a, not what you would expect at all um, from someone in that position. A school teacher? A school teacher, yeah. With impressionable young children? Yes. Who he played a counselling role 
helping them in their own problems in their lives. Yes. Graham, for the record, can you just state your full name again, thanks? Graham Frederick McNeil. In your address. Two weeks after Robert's shooting, Graham McNeil was arrested. What's your role in the clan? I am uh, the chaplain. Does that make you some sort of head of the clan? Or... I'm one of the Imperial officers, yes. And just like Anthony Rawlingson, he was arrogant and evasive when questioned by police. Did you have any concern at all that you had assisted someone yes, I did. after the completion of a murder? But he finally admitted he'd helped dispose of the body, claiming he'd only done so because he was scared of Anthony. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm thinking that I'm sitting next to a young fellow who's done this. Yeah. And to be quite honest, I don't think would have had any problem doing it to me. So he was concerned for his own safety? Absolutely. And then why did he not then go to police after it all occurred? That's the question we don't know the answer to. Oh, bullshit. He feared, I'll tell you what he feared for. He feared if they got hold of Anthony, Anthony might spill the beans about all the other crap that was going on. Fear, good God, no. Anthony Rollingson and Graham McNeil were tried separately. Rollingson pleaded guilty to his brother's murder but he continued to protect McNeil, denying he had any influence over him whatsoever. So you're adamant that he's been put up to this? Well, all the evidence point that way. Um, Anthony won't talk about it and McNeil's never said anything about it. So, um, but all the evidence, when you line up the ducks, it all points that way. Anthony Rollinson was sentenced to life in jail with a minimum 15 years. The sentencing judge described the crime as heinous and said Anthony had displayed absolutely no remorse. Do you think that a 16-year-old deserved a penalty that harsh? I tend to think he deserved it. And has he ever expressed any remorse? Not about his brother, no. Graham McNeil pleaded guilty to helping Anthony dispose of his brother's body and of lying to police. He received eight years in prison but was released after just three years. Mr McNeil, would you mind just having a, a quick chat? Unbelievably, he's now back in Pittsworth living with his parents. Mr McNeil? But he refuses to talk about the case. Hey, piss off. Yeah, I thought he got a very light tariff. So you think his sentence was too lenient? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, he's not fit to walk the streets, that bloke. While Graham McNeil may be a free man, John Rawlingson and his wife, Wendell, will never be free of the torment they suffer in the aftermath of this tragedy. You've lost two sons, haven't you, really? That's right. And you and Wendell now? How are you doing? I'm probably doing a little bit better than Wendell. Um, there's a few photographs around the place, not a lot. We removed most of them because uh, it is hurtful to see the memories and, and uh, that sort of thing. Still to come, the inside story of a young mother. She was a beautiful soul. Seduced by devil worshippers. She felt dirty. She felt demoralised. A dark world of sex, jealousy and finally, murder. She was easy prey, an impressionable young mother searching for some meaning in her life. He was a natural predator, a devil worshipper who claimed he could communicate with the spirits. It would turn out to be a deadly combination. In Sydney suburbs, a brutal attack on a terrified woman. Melissa Mayfield has crossed over to the dark side. She's diced with the devil, and now she's going to die. She was giving and loving. She was a beautiful soul. But where is she now? A scheming, sex-crazed couple, a naive single mum, a demonic cast of characters. This is a real-life horror story. 
But tragically, Melissa Mayfield didn't realise exactly what she was caught up in until it was too late. She was just scared. She was just very fearful. She just said that she felt scared. Melissa Mayfield was a single mother living in Sydney's western suburbs with her two young daughters, Kira and baby Candace. She was a very good mum, wasn't she? Yes, she was. She, she done it on her own. And she was a proud mother. She just was coming all together. She, she, she was just, I think, loving her life, loving it that she's got the two girls and, and just having a family there. Um, that's her and her old dog. She looks like a wonderful mum. Of course. Melissa's she... eldest daughter, Kira, was only 12 when her mother was murdered, but the memories are still vivid. What do you remember about her? She was really hyper. Yeah, she was always very active and hyper and stuff, very talkative, not shy. Yeah, she was nice. Melissa had always been interested in the spiritual world, something she'd inherited from her mother, Donna May. I brought my daughter up that there's another side out there. I tried to show her the whole world, to open her up to that. Not doing black magic and stuff. My daughter wouldn't know anything about stuff like that. My daughter would never go near the bad. But when Melissa met Angela Wells and her partner, David Shepherd, that all began to change. They soon became the best of friends. Before long, though, a much darker side to this couple emerged. So he tried to put on characters? He, or? Yeah, he put on a different voice and stuff and act like he was possessed and stuff. And it really creeped us out. And why do you think he was doing that? Probably to try and take control of my mum. Shepard claimed he was a psychic who could channel spirits, and he preyed on Melissa's trust and naivety, saying he could help her connect with her dead grandmother. You think that Melissa would have been open to being manipulated? She believes in her friends, and if one of her friends was to say something to her, she'd believe that friend. Melissa's former schoolmate, Kelly Chapman, introduced her to Angela, a decision she bitterly regrets. For a very long time, I felt it was my fault. And do you still dwell on that now? A bit. What started out as little more than a flirtation with the occult soon spiralled out of control. Before long, David Shepard convinced Melissa that she was possessed, but he had a solution. He could drive out her demons by sleeping with her. Melissa said it, was, it just happened so quickly. She was in shock and she said she didn't willingly partake in it. What did she say about, about having sex with David? She felt dirty. She felt demoralised. Everything she stands for, she felt she had lost. <laughs> David and Angela now had total control over Melissa, but Angela was getting increasingly jealous of her husband's growing attraction towards her friend. Uh, Angela's a very jealous person. I've known Angela for quite a few years and she was very jealous. Melissa decided that she had to escape the dark world that she'd been drawn into. But it wasn't that easy. He was telling her things like, don't go to work today, you're going to get killed by a drunk truck driver. You will die if you leave the house. Telling her to take clippings of her hair and her daughter's hair and put them outside the house, which when we looked up on the internet was a devil call card. So how did that make her feel? She was scared, but she was scared to go to the police. And scared because? Because she didn't know how bad David would get. Melissa had good reason to be scared of David Shepherd and Angela Wells, and in the weeks leading up to her murder, she thought she'd finally gotten them out of her life. And then, in the early hours of June the 14th, 2006, Melissa was proved terribly wrong. As David choked Melissa in the lounge room, 
the two children slept just metres away. David then fled. He was picked up down the road by Angela and they drove home. But fearing Melissa may have survived the attack, the couple returned several hours later to finish off the job. I remember waking up from um, him banging on my window and I was really confused because I didn't know what was going on. He was like, oh, you know, I'm here to help and stuff. So I went and opened the door for him. Did you know that your mum had actually been hurt? No, I knew something was wrong because obviously she was lying on the floor and she couldn't move. She was, like, lifting up her arm and she was trying to mumble something to me, but I couldn't understand. I stood there and he's like, go to your room. I was like, OK, and then I ran into my room. And, and what was their behaviour like on the night? Very aggressive. He was very aggressive. So you felt like you had to do what he said? It just scared me because I was only young and I didn't know what was going on. At 5.26am, emergency services received this frantic triple zero call. Ambulance emergency, what's up there, please? It's Busley Park. I'm doing heart palpitations at the moment. When David Shepard was on the phone, he was still strangling Melissa. He had one hand calling, um, to, speaking to the triple A operator, and the other hand strangling uh, Melissa around her throat. Seemingly trying to save her life. That's correct. Strangled her then until, her, until we heard the neck crack. Brutal. Mm, it was. When the ambulance crew arrived, Melissa was unconscious on the floor. She'd gone into cardiac arrest. David and Angela claimed she'd phoned them after hearing an intruder in her backyard. As they worked desperately to revive her, paramedics noticed Melissa had extensive bruising on her neck and around her eyes. Let's go again. Her into the recovery position. And that's when I saw her next door neighbour, who come running over to me screaming, saying, she's gone, she's gone, they've taken her. And I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, Melissa. Melissa was in hospital on life support. As she teetered on the edge, her family and friends gathered at her bedside. So I didn't even recognise her. She was that swollen. It looked like a totally different person. It didn't look like my friend. So did you get to at least spend time with her? Yes, I did. Mm. And did you talk to her? I did. What sort of things did you say? Don't leave me. Sorry. Next, Angela's surprise betrayal as the killers turn on each other. You can hear this blood curdling scream. It was terrible. Melissa Mayfield is in hospital after a brutal attack at her home. She's in a coma, brain dead. I was fine until I saw her and then I kind of broke down. Like all the bruises and stuff, that's what kind of freaked me out a lot. After four days, Melissa's family makes the painful decision to switch off her life support system. I just held her hand and I talked to her. What can you say? I held her hand. I have to warn you that you're not obliged to say or do anything unless you wish to do so. Police now had a murder on their hands and right from the start, they suspected Angela Wells and David Shepherd. Their story about an intruder attacking Melissa just didn't stack up. It was like they practised what they were going to say to us. Um, it was just so, um, so clinical. He's trying to explain away his, even his DNA on, on Melissa. He was just trying to explain everything away, which is strange from a person that found one of their friends lying, dying on the ground. It wasn't natural. I know I broke a neck, cracked her head when she was unconscious. And detectives soon uncovered the sordid truth. We should never have gone back over there. In these overheard conversations, Wells and Shepard leave little doubt about their guilt. I think they're going to try and nail me today. So they didn't really think through 
everything. They were quite clinical, but didn't actually follow it through. No. Yeah, their biggest thing was they thought they were smarter than everyone else, I think. Police brought David Shepherd in to question him further and he'd changed his story completely. No longer was he blaming intruders for the fatal attack on Melissa Mayfield. Now he claimed it was the devil. And Angie woke me and said that she'd been speaking to my voices and that it had, had to happen right now. It was one of several different stories Shepard told police. He even tried to claim Melissa was blackmailing him and had attacked him with a knife when he confronted her about it. He said that Melissa pulled a knife on him, which is a lie. We never believed that. Never believed that at all. Was he still trying to resuscitate me? He was still trying to get Melissa to respond to him. Up until now, Angela Wells had loyally stuck by David Shepard, backing up his version of events. But what happened next would turn her against him for good. Fearing that Angela would confess, Shepard decided to kill her too. He drugged her evening meal. When she passed out, placed her in the bath. He then wrote a fake suicide note, but when Shepard realised his lover was still alive, he tried to slit her wrists. Angela woke in terror. That alerted police who were listening in. She goes from snoring to this blood curdling scream. It was terrible. And you could hear that all very clearly? Yes. Could you um, get into the position where you think David was at that time? Police interviewed Angela and now she turned on Shepard. David was strangling Melissa in, with his hands. She admitted she'd lied to protect her partner and gave a graphic account of how he strangled Melissa Mayfield. After he tried strangling, he put his knee into her throat and pushed down with his mind until her neck cracked. So she implicated David entirely in the crime? Yeah, basically rolled over. But I know I didn't strangle Melissa like everyone thinks. Shepard was charged with Melissa's murder and the attempted murder of Angela Wells, but he wasn't going down alone. And in a desperate attempt to incriminate Angela in Melissa's death, he changed his story yet again. Why would Angie go missing for two hours and tell me that she did what I couldn't do? But Wells was sticking to her version of events, claiming she was an unwitting accomplice. I remember standing behind both Mel and, and David and I froze, I didn't know what to do. So do you think that Angela had a, a, a big role to play in this? I think they worked together. And why do you think that? I think she she become very jealous of um, Melissa and I think she basically wanted her out of the way. Just direct, direct us. Keep going straight. Shepard later took police to the car park where he and Wells disposed of Melissa's handbag to support their story that she'd been robbed by an intruder. Here, detectives found some of Melissa's hair clips and bobby pins and her bag in a nearby drain. Wells denied she'd helped get rid of Melissa's belongings, but CCTV footage proved she was in the area at the time that Shepard claimed. Police charged her with being an accessory. Angela Wells, I'm now informing you that you're going to be formally charged with the murder of Melissa Mayfield, an accessory after the fact. Do you understand that? What was Angela's demeanour like when she was charged? I wouldn't say remorseful. She was just... Um, upset. She was in self-protection mode. Now, do you want to participate in this interview now? I've got no further comments. These two people are very selfish. So she was just upset because she was basically caught. She wasn't concerned about Melissa at all. The next thing I know, I'm on top of Melissa. But my hands are around the throat. It wasn't until his third interview that David Shepard finally confessed to actually strangling Melissa claiming voices had driven him to do it. I just couldn't let go, I don't know why. The voices were so loud. The thought of Angie going crooked me. I just left. Sometimes he'd be, he'd be crying, he'd be very emotional. Other times he'd be straight, um, straight talking like you and me. Other times he'd be just 
staring into space. Uh, I think he was just trying to play the mental health card. At his trial, David Shepherd pleaded guilty so he didn't have to give any further evidence. The judge accepted his claim that the killing was spontaneous, but he said there was no proof that he suffered from a mental illness. He was sentenced to jail for 19 years with a non-parole period of 15 years. David Shepherd will be free in 2025. And what did you think about that sentence? <laughs> Free meal every day, shower, dentist, doctors, visitors. Family can still come and see you. You could see him smile, you can talk to him. I can't. At her trial, Angela Wells pleaded guilty to being an accessory. In sentencing her, the judge described her as an unreliable witness of questionable credibility. Wells served just 18 months in prison. I didn't think justice was done. I thought she got away basically scot-free for what she had done. Having driven David to her house, Knowing what he was going to do, she's a very manipulative lady. She's also a manipulative person and very selfish. And she had the power to protect her friend. That's right. And she didn't. Yeah. Coming up, the torment continues. It's a ridiculous situation. For two families. This, for God's sake, was a bloody murder. Melissa Mayfield was betrayed by friends, strangled in her own lounge room while her daughters slept. Just why David Shepherd attacked Melissa Mayfield that night has never been fully explained. Shepherd blamed it on inner voices, demons urging him to kill, a claim dismissed as nonsense at his trial. But even the judge conceded that Shepherd's interest in the supernatural could well have driven him to murder. They were jealous of who she was. So my daughter was beautiful and she was very pretty and loving and she had the package. And what do you think about when you see, when you see your mum? Eldest daughter, Kira, was 12 at the time of this terrible family tragedy. Her baby sister, Candace, just 18 months old. And do you think about her often? Yeah, it just like sometimes when like I'll meet someone new, I'll be like, my mum would like you, stuff like that. Yeah. Melissa Mayfield's killer, David Shepherd, is now behind bars at Cooma Prison. He'll be there for another 11 years, but his accomplice, Angela Wells, is free. If you ever bumped into Angela, what do you think you'd say? I hope I don't because I wouldn't be saying anything. What would you be doing? I'll probably go to jail. You hate her that much? Beyond words. I cry. I cry more than tears. I cry... I cry for Kira. I cry for Candace. Only this morning, I held the picture. <laughs> and I was cuddling it and holding it. And I said, I know I won't get you back, but just be here for me. <laughs> just be here for me. Yes, yeah, so tell me the... Uh... Up in Queensland, John Rawlingson can only ponder what might have been. This is uh, your heartland, your, your country. You've been up here a long time. Yeah. He's lost one son and the other is in prison for his murder. It's a burden no parent should ever have to shoulder. It's like a scab on a wound. Once you brush it off, it, it all oozes out again. And, you know, you can talk yourself around to getting up and getting on with it. But, I mean, it's still there. It looks, looks at you every day, the, the waste. That's what it is, it's just a damn waste. A year ago, John and wife Wendell sold the family farm. There were just too many painful memories. They moved into town to try to start again. 
but now there's a new threat to their peace of mind. We actually just wanted to give Graham a chance to, to give his son. Graham McNeil is now out of prison after serving just three years behind bars. He's back in the district and incredibly, he's soon eligible to teach again. It's a ridiculous situation. Teachers get banned for life for sexual abuse of children, as they should. That's appalling. This, for God's sake, was a bloody murder. It's now seven years since Anthony Rowlingson was jailed for the murder of his brother, Robert. Each month, his parents visit him in Queensland's Gatton prison. When their boy finally gets out of jail in 2023, he'll be 32 years old. Have you forgiven Anthony? Well, I think basically, yes. Um, there'll always be questions you'll ask, and there'll always be um, things that you'll look at and wonder about, but that's there, I mean, that's it.